Good morning and welcome to Axa Coral Live, beaming from the Kamabi Research Station here on Curacao. It's a beautiful morning, a few storms around, uh, but it's really great to welcome you to this session, which is a live investigation looking at ocean acidification uh, and the impact of carbon dioxide on the reef on coral. Over the past few days, we've been looking at the coral polyp on Monday, the coral ecosystem on Wednesday. But a lot of the questions that we've been getting through have been about, well, we've seen in the news that uh, coral is, is suffering at the moment. What's going on there? And is there anything that we can do to, to help? And so today's live investigation is looking at one of those impacts on coral and it's a process uh, called ocean acidification. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of investigations. One of them is going to be looking at that process of ocean acidification. So what you'll need is you'll need a container with, um, with some water in it. Now, distilled water is going to be better because sometimes very hard water, it's hard to do this with. You're going to need some kind of pH indicator. Now, some of you may have been uh, making some red cabbage uh, pH indicator. And I apologise to any teacher who's been doing that at home and because uh, your house and kitchen is probably a little bit stinky. Making red cabbage indicator is not the nicest um, smelling of things to do. Uh, we've got an electronic uh, pH meter here, or you might be using something like litmus paper or some other kind of indicator. And then what you will need also is we're going to do this, we're going to look at car getting carbon dioxide in uh, through your breath. And so you'll need uh, a straw and I have pipettes here, but I think I'll use, um, just looking in here, I'm not using plastic on the island, um, but here's my glass bit of chemistry lab kit, which I'm going to use as my straw. So those are the, the, the few things that you need um, this morning. But w before we start our live investigation, I'm just going to see who we have online this morning. Um, wow, great to have schools from Greece, the UK, India, Switzerland and Nigeria. Um, and some shout outs to Ashley uh, Church of England Primary School in Walton on Thames, um, Ocken Lodment uh, Primary in Johnston, Burkle Primary School in Dundee, Bromsgrove School, Calendar Primary in Calendar, Discovery Primary School, Greenhill Primary in Coatbridge, Greenleaf Primary School um, in London, Our Ladies in Ab Abingdon. Springside Primary in Irvine, North Ayrshire, and St Winifred's Roman Catholic Primary in London. And not to forget, the 5th Gymnasium of Glyfada is watching from Greece. Welcome, one and all. Great to have you with us. So, I'm going to get some distilled water for me. And so what I want everyone to do, whether in probably in groups of sort of two or three, maybe even three or four, um, you need to get your container, which I'm going to put on this side here, and fill it about two thirds with water. Don't fill it all, up, all the way up to the top. Put about two thirds with water and I'm going to come a bit closer to this camera about there oh we'll go back to where I was Ellie's, Ellie's, Ellie's been very good in making it easier for me rather than having to come down the jetty um, I was trying to make it easier for her and what we're going to do is we're going to put carbon dioxide into this and the way that we're going to do that is by blowing through our straw. I'm going to stop after one minute. I'm just going to demonstrate this. Don't start yet. 
Now, gently blowing. So what we don't want to see is this kind of behavior. <laughs> and I have seen it before. Don't get too excited, but nice gentle blow. And don't forget uh, to take a break, breathe, and definitely don't do it for longer than a minute for one person. Maybe even think about swapping every 30 seconds. So, but before I start, and before you start, we're gonna have a go at guessing. Oh. And we've got, um, I'm not gonna pronounce this right, but Mrs. Sorga School in Ontario, in Canada. I'm going to test what the pH of this water is. Um, So I'm going to put my pH meter in. Having calibrated it this morning, we now is telling me that I've in fact got hydrochloric acid in my cup. So we'll just let it come back up again. So what you should be testing is you should be getting about pH 7. If it's a little bit above that, pH sort of 7.2, 7.3, um, that's that's pretty natural for water coming out of the tap. Now, let's see here. Okay. Okay, so... One I was going to go, I've got this working again now. So I've currently got a pH of 6.86. I'm in here. And I'm going to start blowing through the water. I'm going to see how it changes. So for one minute, stop my stopwatch. Take that out of there. And I'm now going to see whether the pH has changed at all. Ooh. Everything's going to go in very carefully. Lots of nice, nice slats on this. So let's see what we've got here. So I can see, 
It's going to take, give that a little bit of time to, to get back to normal. So can we just find out how you're getting on? Has your pH changed at all where you are? Are any of you using a pH meter or anything like that to tell, tell me what the pH you have? Can you tell any change so far? Don't put any indicator in. So we've got a slight decrease here down to, we, have, we started off with 6.86 um, because I've been blowing through it a little bit before and it's gone down to 6.7. Um, so I'm gonna carry on going. Okay, reset, reset my um, watch. You all ready for one more minute of blowing? Hopefully you've, you've got your first measurement there. You've got your pH 7, 7.2, something like that. And you've got a second measurement that you've tried to take. Okay, going again. Oof. So one more minute in there. Put my straw back in there so it doesn't fall in the drink. And then we'll see how we're getting on. So it was, I think it was about 6.71 before. And we've come down by another 0.2. Oh, yep. So we are currently 6.71. 5.2 or 6.53 at the moment. And I'm just, hopefully you've got some changes. You can see if you're using litmus paper, that's great. If you're using cabbage water, then hold on before putting any cabbage water in because you definitely don't want to be blowing that around. Okay, so, oh. Okay, so we'll see one more time and we'll see if we get any lower. there okay How are you getting on in the classroom? And then last but not least, from 6.51, 6.52, we are going to get actually haven't gone down by that much more. We're still on um, six point oh let's wait for the pH meter. Oh here we go. 
I thought it hadn't changed much. In fact, it hasn't changed huge amounts, but we've dropped another, not much at all. We've only dropped another 0.4, but there we go. Uh, so it's 6.4, 6.4 7. So what we've been doing here, and I'll explain this process again, and it's what's happening in the ocean here. So, we've got um, some corals down here. We've got an ocean temperature of, I mean, ocean pH of about 8.1, 8.2. But that pH, that level of acidity in the water has changed over the past sort of 200 odd years and in fact there's been a 30 percent increase in acidity in the waters here and that change over time is starting to make it more difficult for the coral and it's a bit dark this morning but maybe i think that um, we took some footage of the corals just down on this pile here show you corals in their natural habitat and then start to think about what kind of issues may be at play if the pH, if the acidity, the chemistry of the oceans is changing. So we're just looking to get up a little bit of footage that we took from yesterday afternoon. And we will see if we can show you to look at coral in its natural habitat. And then look at a coral skeleton. And then we'll think about you know, what the changes in acidity might mean. Now, extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is having two types of impacts on the ocean. It's having an impact on ocean acidification, and that's what we're talking about today. And we'll talk about that process of more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere changing the chemistry of the ocean. The second impact it's having is the warming. So because of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, trapping additional heat or in the, in the sort of global system, a lot of that extra energy is being stored as heat in the ocean. And we'll find out more about that um, when we talk to Dr. René van der Sander. And that is in our expert interview straight after, well, 45 minutes after this live investigation but the reef is looking like it's unwilling to play today and so we'll just go back to our discussion of ocean chemistry and this guy here the, the coral so carbon dioxide in the atmosphere coming into our ocean like that and changing its pH. So the carbon dioxide reacting with the water, forming a weak acid, carbonic acid, and then that's changing the pH, the acidity of the ocean. Now, why does the acidity of the ocean matter to corals? So yesterday and the day before i mean wednesday and, and monday we were looking at the coral polyp and the coral ecosystem and how this formed now coral is a living animal the coral polyp related to a jellyfish and to a sea anemone and it settles on the seafloor or on the side of a pile on a jetty and little polyp starts to grow and another little polyp starts to grow and starts to grow and then it needs to start to grow up because there's so many polyps they split into two creating copies of themselves and so they start to grow these amazing structures and the way they grow these structures is by taking calcium carbonate a mineral out of the seawater so dissolved in the seawater calcium carbonate mineral now the problem, the big problem for coral is that when the pH 
of the ocean changes, it becomes harder to make these amazing structures. And we're going to look at the impact of an acid. And in this case, what I'm going to be using is a, um, some vinegar. So what you'll need for this activity, so remember we've looked at how carbon dioxide changes the chemistry. Now we're looking at how, if that water is more acidic, what impact might it have? So all I'm going to do, he says, is open this bottle of um, vinegar. Carefully put that bit of plastic, probably in my pocket, probably easiest. Fasten that up so that doesn't get in the ocean. Open this up, and we're going to put some vinegar in here. Nothing like a, a whiff of vinegar early in the morning to wake you up. Oh, that's probably quite enough. We don't need huge amounts. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how that reacts. Not with coral, we're not going to drop a bit of coral in here, even though it's a skeleton. But um, shells, oh, well, let's have a, a green for this morning, shall we? Um, a shell, like from the rubbish from a, a nearby fish restaurant, or we're going to use some chalk, and chalk is the same um, chemical substance as limestone, as the coral skeleton structure, um, calcium carbonate. If you are using chalk in the classroom, apparently the chalk in Curacao doesn't have a plastic coating on it, or wax coating to, to stop your fingers getting covered in chalk. But quite often, I can remember um, in the UK, you quite often have a little coating on it to stop it coming off on your fingers. If that is to break the chalk up into little bits, yeah, just so that the ends are exposed and you'll get the chemical reaction you're looking for. So I'm going to take my, um, Ellie, it might be easiest if I do this on the jetty, so I'm going to put it, put it down here and we'll get a camera on that um, shortly. Do you want me to bring it closer? That's okay. And I'm just going to he says, <laughs> break. Little lumps of our, our coral into the acid, into the vinegar. Can we see the reaction happening? So what we've got is we can see the reaction here. We've got an acid plus calcium carbonate and we can see the carbon dioxide coming off that. Now the pH of this is going to be nowhere near what, you know, what, what the ocean is. And so this is just a very extreme example. So we're not suggesting at the moment that the oceans are getting to a state where they're so acid that if I put my foot in it, it's going to dissolve off or that the, uh, we're going to see the rapid dissolution of the coral animal um, at the same time. Uh, but what we're showing here is that the coral, the chalk, really doesn't like it when it becomes more acidic in the ocean. And what's happening for the coral isn't necessarily it's dissolving, is that it's trying to grab on to this calcium carbonate in the water. But when it's more acidic, there's less around. That's harder. And so it's spending more energy trying to get the calcium carbonate to make its structures and if it's using more energy for that it has less energy for reproduction and growth so it's potentially slowing down um, the growth of the reef and the reproduction on the reef overall so it's putting an immense amount of stress on the coral animal spending all this energy trying to build its house it's becoming harder the calcium carbonate ions that it, that it needs it are becoming scarcer um, and not reacting not dissolving yet um, but um, we'll, what we're going to do um, in the next session is find out sort of what might happen in different scenarios 
if the pH of the ocean dropped from 8.1 to 7.8 or to 7.6, what might be happening um, to the coral animal? So hopefully in the classroom, what you've been able to see through these two investigations, first of all, we've seen how adding carbon dioxide to water changes its acidity. So that's a drop in the pH. And second, we can see that a more acidic ocean will have a negative impact on the coral animal, making it harder to find and acquire the limestone in the water that helps to make it structural, well, that makes it structure. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at some of the questions you've been sending through. And I don't know at all, Ellie, if we've got... Oh, perfect. I think we've got a little, um, a little treat for you. So when we were um, on the filming to get you some views of, of the coral just down here yesterday, um, we had a little friend uh, come and visit us. So I think we're, we're gonna have a little, little visit to the reef just here, and Ellie will let me know when we're live, but uh, see if you can spot a little treat um, took us completely by surprise, in fact, only really noticed it and when we were reviewing the footage in the office last night. In fact, I asked, I did, I did guess, Ellie, guess what we've, what, what we've got on film. He said a barracuda. A barracuda would have been awesome. There's a barracuda, I think, that lives under that boat just there. Um, but we've got a little, we've got... And for me, what was the amazing thing is that at first, I didn't quite spot it. So well camouflaged, and then it revealed itself. I'm just wondering, can you spot our little friend? Who can, I want to see, see, see on the live chat, who can spot our friend? And also how many different species of fish? You can also maybe try and guess within that picture, my, one of my favorite animals on the reef. Um, if you can spot any tiny Christmas tree like shape sticking out of the coral, um, that is the feeding sort of, sort of feeler from a, from a a worm and um, the Christmas tree worm and I love, just love them. I think they're amazing. They come in all sorts of different colours. So hopefully you've all spotted the wonderful octopus. <laughs> um, it was amazing to see that um, on the footage. I didn't see it, spot it. I was so busy trying to, to keep the, the camera steady. Um, didn't, didn't, didn't spot that when we were filming down there. Uh, real great treat. And that is literally just down um, about six feet away uh, from where I'm sitting now. So what's going to happen now is we're ready for your questions coming through and we're going to get those um, set up and I'm just going to make sure Just have to update the settings here, and we'll get you right in with the questions. So just enjoy the reef for a couple more ticks. and then we'll get you back online. Very fickle, um, there we go. So 
what's just happening at the moment is that we're just having a slight delay on being able to get the questions coming through for you. Ellie, do you mind relaying some of the questions um, to me because the signal's not, not getting quite as far and I know that we've wired you up um, to the internet. I'm, I'm, I'm on a very extended Wi-Fi. How big was the octopus? Um, only, only about that big, so, so tiny wee. So, um, so we don't have this massive gargantuan octopus for you. Uh, the coral colonies you're looking at are about that big. So if you think, imagine the sort of like the, the, those brain corals on there, they're about that big. And then you can see the octopus coming across past the anemone like that. Martin, yeah. Are humans the most, the biggest, uh, Martin's asking, are humans the biggest threat to the coral reef? And that's a great question. I mean, the coral reef um, has changed over time, but I think that the, the, you know, the speed at which we're affecting the natural environment is really affecting the coral reef more than any other organism, um, living thing on the planet. So we're talking today about those system-wide threats um, the uh, ocean acidification and the warming that leads to coral bleaching and we'll be talking about coral bleaching in the next session but then of course you've got the local threats people here talking about the impact of sewage raw sewage on the reef um, and that is uh, in, in two ways here in Curaçao so first of all that there's the, that direct pollution um, and polluting the waters and, and harming the coral in that way and the second is that the sewage acts like a fertilizer and so that fertilizer leads to a greater amount of algae and that algae is is often um, overgrowing um, the reef and so always a competition between coral and algae and then when you add that extra sewage in that just accelerates the algal growth and turns the reef to sort of slimy slime from Emil, Emil asking um, if I could tell students um, to do just one thing um, to um, save the reef or to help protect the reef. I was going to come and grab the laptop and hopefully we've got a little bit of, that's awesome. And okay, great. Thanks so much. Oh, um, where are we? And this is from Emil. Um, doable in any part of the world, what would it be? That's a great question, Emil, because often uh, the reef sort of feels very far away and, and today we're trying to bring it closer to you. Um, I think it's really interesting. I think that, you know, talking today about the, the um, carbon dioxide and the resource use that is affecting the reef. Now, the oceans are connected all over the world. So what we need to look at is really sort of three things. Um, this is... Um, we're looking at what you eat, how you travel, and how you live. And looking at one big thing that you can do. So if you switch to a vegetable-based diet, you're gonna massively reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions, water use, potential uh, fertilizer runoff going into the ocean. That's just one thing to think about, on eating locally as well and seasonally. So how you eat is a really, really big impact. How you travel, so do you travel um, in a car, do you travel by bike, on foot, public transport? Changing the way that you travel um, is a really big part of how you can change your impact on, on the planet. And the third is how you live. Do you put the heating on in the winter or do you put a woolly pulley on? So those three things look at how you can just take one part of your life whether it's how you eat how you travel how you live and just make a big substantial change and that will help the reef wherever you are um, here we have um, Oliver's asking what type of octopus was that I will find out Oliver I'm not um, an, I'm afraid an octopus expert but we'll ask some of the team here and we'll get that up on our Twitter. So we'll get the whole still 
I think we can get a steal from that and we'll post a picture of the octopus with its species um, sometime today. So we'll get that up, don't worry. Um, you, how do you and other researchers take precautions to make sure you don't disturb or damage the corals when you're diving near them? Um, and that's from Adabanji. So that's a really great question because of course if you touch or knock coral, that's going to have a sort of negative impact on the reef. I'm just looking behind us because I'm looking at the black clouds. Um, so because if it uh, hopefully doesn't rain on us, because um, that, that could be, be an issue. But so you learn how to dive like a recreational diver, a sort of tourist diver, and that takes you to a certain level. In fact, science diving is you're learning a lot about how to stay very, very still, very, very close um, to the coral reef. So it's, it's, it's a skill to know about your neutral buoyancy, buoyancy control, staying near what you're studying, but also not knocking into it. So it's a really great question and a skill that you have to master when on the reef. Um, this is from Kiki. Uh, what piqued your interest to study coral reefs? So, Kiki, I'm, I'm not a marine um, biologist or an oceanographer, but I work with a lot of them um, over the years. Um, some of the researchers here, uh, uh, Pim, who we're speaking to next week, uh, I first met on Heron Island um, six years ago and have been working and helping them do their education outreach. But for me, I think the oceans in, the, in general and the coral reef in particular, they're massively unknown, amazing places. And I think that certainly when I went on to the reef, right out on the reef for the first time and, and dived on the reef for the first time, it was like entering another world and, and a magical world at that. There were all these shapes, sizes, colours, and it's an experience that I don't think you can really get on land. Uh, insofar as, you know, I'm down filming here, I'm, you know, there's a 10 different species of fish within sort of touching distance, if I, you know, if I were to be so bold. There was an octopus, there's coral, um, there's all those um, different types of things. And um, it's, it's, just, it's just magic. And then sharing that with you guys. I mean, the coral reef could be the first ecosystem that is wiped out in its entirety by, by humankind. And to be able to share how wonderful it is with you guys is a real treat. Um, so we're going to carry on doing that and carry on suggesting how we can work towards saving it. Um, from Sam, can we see the chalk again? Can we see how much it's dissolved? Well, I haven't dissolved too, too much, but do you want me to, can you zoom in on that? Um, some, definitely some, I'm going to get vinegar all over my fingers, but get a um, so you can see here, we're still bubbling away. We're still reacting. But I think like what I've felt like earlier is that there's a surface. Um, so if I smushed it up a bit more, you're going to get more of a reaction. But because it's got a flat surface and, it, and it's quite smooth, the reaction doesn't take place terribly fast. It's only on the ends where it's taking place. Um, but if I leave that, um, I'll take a photograph at the end of the day. How's that of how it's looking and get that online for you. Um, are there any negative side effects of protecting coral reefs? Um, are there, it depends who you talk to, I suppose. Now, um, there, is, there is a balance between, um, I think what might, one could say, sort of economic development uh, and, and nature conservation. Uh, so, for instance, if, you, if a new port um, was to bring a lot of money uh, to an island and um, new jobs, new trade, a, a sustainable source of food or fuel uh, for a whole country perhaps and that involved um, building a, a port um, and building um, uh, shipping channels which would mean 
taking out the coral reef. Um, so there's a, there's a balance between economic development and, and nature conservation, and, and it's up to all of us to decide where that balance should be. Um, there's no sort of right or wrong saying, you know, this, this is, this is, this is what, what's going on. And um, here we have um, the rain. Here comes the rain. Um, so we've got two more questions and then we might just dash inside. Uh, so very quickly, do you believe uh, that corals will adapt to the environment um, should the temperature rise more? That's from Alex. Um, I think, Alex, the really important thing to think about is not just the so absolute amount of change. So is, it going, is the temperature here going from 29 degrees to 30 degrees to 31 degrees? It's the speed and the variability. So what we see um, with bleaching um, is that it's those, the changes um, above the normal that's happening and the speed of change. So we're going to talk a little bit about more of that. But, you know, can corals adapt to change? They have adapted slowly over time but not to these rapid changes we're finding at the moment. And Poppy, uh, have you seen much plastic rubbish on the reef? Poppy, not huge amounts um, here, but certainly plastic uh, is an issue. And one of the interesting but slightly sad um, areas that people are looking at at the moment is to what extent that plastics may be what's called a vector for coral disease, so carrying coral, coral disease from one part um, of the ocean to another. So we're, we're getting rained on at the moment, but it looks like a shower, so I might just stick a computer up my jumper, as it were, and put that in my pocket, and then hopefully it will blow over. Um, I'm just going to fold this up just so we don't get completely wet, and then I will end this broadcast um you want me to stick it up my jumper no it's fine um so really today what we wanted to share with you and thank you so much for all your great questions was corals are being corals are wonderful the little octopus is wonderful the reef is a very very precious and beautiful place we didn't get into the many benefits it provides us today. Increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing the chemistry of the ocean. That change in chemistry is affecting the coral reef by putting stress on it, making it harder for the coral reef, the coral animal, to grow its amazing structure. There are things that we can do to lessen our impact on the environment and the things that we can do wherever we live. Whether it's by looking at how we eat, how we travel and how we live. The coral reef, whether it's a few colonies on a pile here or the amazing reef just out which you can maybe see where the waters turn dark and the reef slope begins. It's an incredibly important, rich environment covering just 2% of the ocean and yet supporting 25% of all marine life. Thank you so much to all those classes who have taken part in this live investigation here from the Kamabi Research Station in Curaçao and do come back to the rest of the sessions today on Axa Coral Live. We've got an expert interview coming up in 45 minutes and we have um, Ask Me Anything following that. On Tuesday, we go deeper on the reef with Dr. Pim Bongart and hear about how the deep reef is, is surviving. And then on Thursday, we're looking at coral uh, adaptation and, in fact, adaptation on the wider reef system. So look forward to having you then. And for now, goodbye from Curacao.